Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Vice President VMware, Tom Korn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it's a, uh, really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, obviously, there's been an enormous amount of news, there's been an enormous amount of uh, uh, happenings around in the area of security. Uh, some of them have happened really only in the last few months. Some major acquisitions like Carbon Black, new capabilities in NSX with IDS and IPS, very innovative solutions like Secure State. So what we wanted to provide in this brief session was to put it in, set this in context of our overall vision in security and our strategy where we're at with that. And then something we started a tradition a, a few years ago uh, was to devote about half of this session to a live wargaming. Uh, we're going to bring up a red team. We're going to bring up a blue team. We've set up a couple of live applications in, data, in a data center in California. And uh, one team is going to attack it. One team is going to defend it. And one of the nice things about this is uh, it starts to bring some of the concepts we're going to be talking to about uh, alive. And we can sort of see that in action to start to make this uh, tangible, if you will. But I'd like to start today with the following phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's an expression we've seen and probably used many times before. And it's, it's generally uh, <clears throat> understood to mean that, you know, the... Uh, effort to, uh, to solve a problem before it overtakes us is far preferable than, uh, than to try to put that effort once a problem has overtaken us. But few of us really know well, where does this expression came from, come from? And uh, you, you may be surprised to know that it actually came from an article in the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1735. The, the topic of this article was, the subject of this article was actually about firefighting. Now it turns out that fire, uh, fires had become a huge problem in colonial America, uh, as it was actually in large parts of Europe. Uh, fires would break out and destroy cities, and what, uh, what the author of this uh, article was basically saying is that uh, we need to start devoting more attention not just to how we fight fires, but how we prevent, predict, and prevent fires. Firefighting obviously had evolved as a practice, both process-wise and technology-wise, for thousands of years by that point. Uh, going back early, as, you know, even to the early Roman period, where you had bucket brigades, you basically had uh, uh, slave labor banding together, passing buckets of water from the river over to wherever you had the fire. And as you went into the medieval period, you started to see other innovations emerge, things like the force pump, well, basically, you forced water through a small chamber in order to create a concentrated stream so people who were fighting fires could now direct water at, from quite a distance from it. Uh, and this sort of emerging during a time of, say, uh, uh, the, the Great London Fire in the, uh, in the 17th century was where we started to see in the early modern period where now we had uh, things like the earliest versions of a fire truck, where now we could bring equipment uh, to where we end and people to fires uh, much faster and at a greater distances. And during this time, if you look over this period, we saw growing investment and growing innovation in how we fight fires. And at the same time, we saw a growing escalation of the, the frequency and the devastation of these fires. It seemed like the only thing growing faster than the, uh, our investment in, 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 the only thing growing faster than the cost of these fires was actually the, the investment in it. We weren't getting ahead of this problem. It's eerily similar to the kind of the, the issues that we face today with our cyber pandemic, where it seems like the, the only thing growing faster than, uh, than our investment in cyber is the cost of these breaches themselves. And nowhere was this more apparent than in colonial America, in cities like uh, Philadelphia, New York, and cities like London, and cities like Paris, where you had, and to understand why, you had sort of large concentration of fuels, right? You had uh, tanners, uh, you had all, you know, people with open flames to cook and heat the homes, you had buildings packed close together, and it was a tinderbox. 
One of these things would go off, a spark would go, an errant spark from a blacksmith's fire, lights up a tanner next door, and these fires would then sweep through a city in no time. And <clears throat> what this, uh, this the, the author of this article, who had been working in firefighting for some point a period of time and actually had organized uh, one of the earliest sort of firefighting regimes in America was basically suggesting is that we need to shift some of our thinking here. This can't just be how do we get more water, more equipment, how do we battle a fire more? We have to start thinking about the sources of these fires, how we predict where these fires, how we prevent these fires. And he started to set up things like uh, neighborhood watches to detect smoke and to also think about where fires might break, sorry, where fires might break out. So uh, where do we have, uh, you know, uh, sources of fuels accumulating? Uh, he started to set up things like uh, chimney sweeps in order to be less susceptible to fires. He, uh, he suggested using things like warming pans instead of open flames where we could uh, set these up. They had the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of the neighborhood watch to be able to keep an eye out for smoke, to be, keep an eye out where we had high winds going through the city, to detect things faster. And then, of course, uh, he organized one of the uh, first sort of uh, professional firefighting forces in, in, in Americas uh, to be able to respond faster to fires. And the work that he started actually continued on uh, over the, uh, the centuries afterwards. You know, when you look today at the big data analytics models that we possess to predict fires, although clearly not enough in California these days, but to predict fires of where they're going to happen, to uh, the technologies to prevent fires, changes in building codes, right? how we construct the materials that we use in buildings, things like smoke detectors for earlier detection of things before it erupts and bursts into flames, and sprinkler systems in buildings in order to have very targeted, automated responses. And that's what he was talking about in this phrase that he coined, an ounce of prevention. Again, eerily similar conceptually to kind of what we're facing today in the, in the cyber domain. But of course, what the author here was focusing on was protecting people and property, and in the cyber world, we're really trying to protect applications and data. And in protecting applications and data, there's a, there's a framework that I like very much. This is actually from Gartner. It's the, called the Adaptive Attack Protection Framework. It's actually part of their larger CARTA initiative. But the notion is, look, our ability to protect our assets is driven in large part by our ability to predict where our risks are, where our exposure is, to be able to prevent where we can harden uh, a rapid, in, you know, real-time response, to be able to detect better and to deal with sort of the campaign, if you will, and how we can automate and streamline the, the, the response. And then part of what they're saying is, look, you really need to start thinking about a common policy models and how these are not just individual steps, but this is a continuous process, an ongoing process. The problems are these. The things that are making it difficult to put that in action is that we have an industry that is incredibly bolted on, incredibly siloed, and very threat-centric, right? Uh, I've been working in security for 15 to 20 years. Uh, for the longest time, you never had to justify what thing you were taking out before you were selling something new in. You just had to show that there was a new threat that's emerged and here was a new technology that deals effectively with that threat. As a result, we have, uh, you know, this is the security toolkit today. Uh, the average organization has today between sort of 70 and 100 security products. There is no area of IT where someone has 50 plus vendors and 70 products. That means 70 agent, sets of agents and appliances, 70 uh, consoles, 70 policy sets that somehow have to be aligned. <clears throat> and there's a the statistic from Gartner is that, you know, in in 90% uh, of breaches leverage misconfiguration and misalignment of these controls. You know, it's past the point of diminishing returns. The complexity in our environments is, has become one of the biggest sources of our problem. The fact that it's siloed, you know, <clears throat> security is a team sport. 
You know, any good chief security officer is going to tell you, you can't just say that the CISO and their security team is responsible for security. We're all responsible for security. The infrastructure team, the network team, the application teams, the businesses themselves who understand what the assets they're trying to protect. But unfortunately, we sit in silos. We don't talk the same language, if you will. Right? We have end user services teams operationalizing antivirus. We have uh, networking teams setting up firewalls and segmentation. We have uh, uh, infrastructure teams dealing with patching, but they aren't connecting together. This is a very, very siloed world. Ironically, attackers are not siloed. An attacker doesn't have a network specialist and an endpoint. I start compromising perhaps a, a device or a user, uh, move that uh, to, to own a device, use that to move and to take ownership on a, a, a virtual machine, a container, a, a server. I move laterally across the network. And we're fighting it in silos. We have to transform this. We have to move from a bolted-on model to a built-in model, where we're dealing with not piles of agents, piles of appliances, consoles, and policy sets. We have to start unifying security, right? And it's not just cramming different products into one console. We have to start thinking about workflow and how these pieces are natural progressions from one another and how we align teams so different teams have a single source of truth and a common language to communicate across. And you cannot solve this purely from a threat perspective. You have to be able to start understanding the applications, the systems that you are protecting. I guarantee you there will never be a magic pill that will enable you to secure your environment and remain completely ignorant about what's running inside. You cannot secure what you do not understand, just like you can't manage what you don't understand. And that means that we're going to have to have the context of the applications, not just their understanding of threats. Now, the VMware vision, as you saw Pat lay out uh, yesterday, is to re for VMware to become this digital foundation for any application, any cloud, uh, from any device. And the work that has been going on in, in solutions like vSphere and uh, VM, VMC and AWS and NSX and vSAN, and the work in extending those to sort of public clouds has really provided a sort of a common fabric to start virtualizing not just software and abstracting so uh, hardware, excuse me, but also abstracting clouds themselves to the pushes that we've made into managing devices with Workspace ONE to obviously a lot of work going in how we create modern application frameworks. But what that has afforded us collectively, not just us, but you as well, is control points that we already possess in our environments in very strategic points. It has given us the cameras, if you will, to have a 360 degree view of exactly what we're trying to protect, the application. If we're trying to protect the patient care system, if you will, it's given us cameras into the workloads that compose that, into the network switches to see how they're communicating and what talks to what, to the, uh, you, the devices and the posture of the devices that are connecting, to the users that are connecting. It has given us very, the perfect set of control points to get the right telemetry and to enforce policy around these. And so a lot of the work we've been doing in building security into this, this intrinsic fabric of security is not just leveraging these control points, but building out the analytics capacity to make sense of that so that we can understand the patient care system is composed of these machines talking these ways over a network. And then we can start to have the capability to compartmentalize the patient care system from a network perspective, to start hardening the workloads that make it up, not generically, but based on their role and their purpose and what they're running to be able to observe which devices and users are connecting into this and what's the posture of those devices so that there's, we're not letting a device with a bad posture or a questionable authenticity of a user connect to a critical system. But at the same token, to not get in their way if they are adequate. And so that's what we have been doing and where products like Workspace ONE have started to flow from not just managing devices, but how do we create 
harden that to get rid of attack surface from that by looking at the posture of the device and the user. Uh, with the technology we built in App Defense and building that into vSphere like vSphere Platinum and VCF Platinum, we can now understand what every workload is and does and start to harden that workload based on that. With solutions like NSX, we're applying that to micro-segmentation and how do we compartmentalize that application. With solutions like Secure State, as we start dealing with workloads that are in the public cloud, we can all consider what is the configuration of that infrastructure, the S3 buckets, the privileged users. So now we've started to, most of that effort has been, how do we start to look at the infrastructure through the lens of the application and harden that accordingly, get rid of the attack surface, an ounce of prevention. But we have started to move up the stack, as you've noticed, to start dealing not just with hardening, but now start to bring in the threat, but bring it in in an intrinsic manner, built in, aligned, unified, and with the consideration of the context of the application that it's operating on. So one of the announcements that you saw yesterday was that NSX has now added distributed IDS and IPS functionality. What's different about it? It's built in, it's distributed, and it's taking into consideration the applications it's doing. It knows what applications, so it's not scanning for things that are not necessary given the workloads that are, that are talking. Right? And there's been more innovations in secure state. Uh, in app defense, you saw probably in the last several weeks, we've added vulnerability management to that. But of course, one of the biggest announcements we made in threat was the acquisition of Carbon Black. And what Carbon Black was, was not just bringing some real critical mass of one of the leaders in the market in the endpoint security space and the security analytics space, but it really represents a new breed of security players that are not just you know, sitting there reverse engineering the attacks of yesterday, but the new approach to security, which is about understanding the systems they are protecting and the behaviors on that system, because the new types of attacks are not just malware, but non-malware attacks, but to be able to leverage the endpoints and the workloads to collect data once, and then to provide rich analytics to do things like next-gen AV, uh, you know, EDR, uh, endpoint detection and response, query and audit, et cetera. And to be able to provide that for the endpoint, carbon black endpoint, and for the workload. But then we're building those some of those capabilities as appropriate into some of the other solutions. We're doing some work to build some of those capabilities into Workspace ONE. So you may have seen the announcement of Workspace Security, so that the end user services teams, the desktop teams themselves, have the capacity to manage those devices and deal with next-gen AV, et cetera, on those devices. Because a lot of security is going to start increasingly to get operationalized through the infrastructure teams, through the network teams, the application teams. That has to happen. That's part of the collaborative effort. We will be putting more of the carbon black technology into vSphere and into VCF, things through the vehicles like Platinum. We are doing some integrations with Secure State for the public cloud, and we will be building analytics modules, security analytics modules, to plug into NSX intelligence to be able to feel what's happening on there. We're bringing that new power of threat analytics into each of these pieces. And of course, this is not about creating all of our eggs in one basket, right? There is an ecosystem. Part of what the philosophy here is you have products today. We need to play nice with the products that you have. But we go deeper with some strategic partners that we have an opportunity, that our leaders in the field, that we have an opportunity to go much deeper in terms of the kinds of integrations and use cases that we enable. But this model of predict, prevent, detect, and respond it's the right model. The problem is that there's a whole host of products that are being deployed in order to solve these problems. And every one of these products has their own set of agents and a own set of appliances, their own consoles, is collecting a set of data, their own versions of truth. This is the, this is the siloed, bolted-on model. Part of what has to happen is some, a lot of these have to start consolidating together. 
We need to start having a unified, a single sensor or no sensors, and a single console to start collapsing some of these pieces. Right? You've, you've seen it in Workspace ONE when they started to bring together identity and, and device together. This has to happen inside security. The other piece that has to happen here from an analytics perspective is security is becoming a big data analytics problem. It's becoming an analytics problem and the data is not only threat data, it's about the systems and the applications that you're trying to protect. Uh, this is a trend that started a while ago in the, in the anti-fraud area. In anti-fraud, we moved from manual, more point-in-time analytics that were more focused on understanding fraud techniques to an approach that was uh, more about automated real-time analytics, understanding how our customers used our banking site or our e-commerce site to be able to spot fraud by the behavior that differed from our normal customers. And some of that same approach is now coming into the endpoint security space and security analytics overall. So what <clears throat> Carbon Black had been doing is using a single lightweight sensor, a fraction of the size of what a sensor today you would normally get from an endpoint security player, a single lightweight sensor that collected a wretch set of data about the systems and the behavior of the systems that are being done but collect one set of data to be able to perform rich analytics. And we're collecting an enormous amount and performing, this, is, this big data is often an overused term, but we analyze over 540 terabytes of data uh, every day, and we are at looking at about 1.3 trillion events every day. To give you a sense of kind of the size and scope of that, that's 20 times the number of messages every day on WhatsApp. That's 230 times the number of searches on Google, or 2,500 times the number of tweets that happen every day, and, and about 700 times the amount of data that's processed by virus. This is a lot of data. <clears throat> but it is, the power is in being able to, ha to be able to analyze across that set of data. So what the Carbon Black Cloud really provides is a single lightweight sensor taking a single set of truth about the behavior of systems and then analyzing it with different analytics for different use cases. Not different products, not different consoles, not different facts, not different data, different analytics on the same data for things like next gen AV, endpoint detection and response, audit and remediation, device control, rogue system detection. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, uh, Carbon Black, it was collecting a lot of the same data that we were doing for app defense, right? In the app defense technology, we were trying to understand the intended purpose and intended behavior of a system. Now, we were using it for use cases to harden the workload. They were using it to try to understand the threat that was going. The beauty is, by bringing these technologies and platforms together, now that same platform has use cases and analytics for workload visibility, change control, app control, vulnerability management, app encryption. It starts to bring a unifying sort of presence to the... Carbon Black today is about 6,000 customers, over 500 partners. It is, I think, bar none, the best technology in endpoint detection and response. They're a leader you know, uh, uh, from the analyst community in the EDR space. And they have... Uh, really, today, if you look at across their customers, they are in the top players across a wide spectrum of industries, from oil and gas and healthcare and retail and telecom and technology. But let's go into this a bit more specifically to each of these areas. And let me start with the endpoint, with the user endpoint. A user endpoint, the challenge there is, it, is that it's a multi-purpose, multi-app, user-controlled device. So you end up with sort of three main sets of problems. One is you have high variability in the posture, right? Um, and the second is that today we have a growing set of very sophisticated sort of malware, ransomware, but also a lot of non-malware attacks. And of course, we're seeing still a growing amount of very sophisticated attacks, APTs, type of things that are going on in our environments. 
Now, the kinds of capabilities that we're going to need to solve these problems, some is the ability to do real-time audit, query, remediation to really deal with some of the posture issues. Next-gen AV is different from traditional AV in that it's not only looking for malware, but it's starting to look at non-malware attacks, right? And things like endpoint detection and response, or EDR, are the technology that's really ideally suited to dealing with how we detect, investigate, and respond to very sophisticated attacks, the living off the land attacks, right? The, the analogy is that, well, the issue is that uh, attackers today are increasingly using good software for doing bad things. Uh, think of the analogy, you know, terrorists moving from using bombs to using a van to drive into a crowd of people, right? <laughs> It's one thing to detect a bomb. It's another thing to say, this is an inherently good device being used for a bad purpose. That's what's happening from a cyber perspective inside our data centers. And EDR is exactly the kind of technology that we need in order to be able to do that. So that is exactly the kinds of analytics that Carbon Black Platform sort of brought into play here. From an audit and remediation perspective, this gives you now the ability to on-demand query and understand any of your endpoints, even if they're offline and disconnected. You can secure a remote shell into any device. You have access to over 1,500 artifacts to be able to on that. So you can remotely perform sort of full investigations and remediations on a device from a posture perspective. When you get into next-gen AV, now you have streaming prevention not just on malware, but non-malware and behavioral type of attacks. This unique behavioral approach is ideally suited for, for this. This is really what next-gen AV brings to the table. And we've been testing this against third parties. It provides some of the strongest protection against ransomware. Um, we've had incredible high tests uh, of efficacy um, from third parties. And the EDR is particularly interesting. This is what gives a SOC full visibility across it, because when you're dealing with advanced attacks, it's not about finding the machine that's compromised. It's about understanding the full campaign that the attacker is executing. So this is the uh, recording a whole stream of endpoint connectivity that you can rewind the tape, if you will, not rewind the tap, and, and be able to search and investigate endpoints. This is the ability to detect the subtle things, the command and control that's going through the environment, right? The, uh, this is the ability to isolate um, systems. And so what Carbon Black Endpoint is, is a package that we are now introducing that takes these set of services, Next Gen AV, Endpoint Detection and Response, Audit and Remediation, as well as an optional sort of managed detection service from a single lightweight sensor and uh, across, all of your, uh, across all of your endpoints. Workspace One obviously is also doing work here to help you manage uh, the, the devices themselves, both uh, Windows and Mac, but also mobile, mobile systems. And what Workspace One is essentially doing is how do we govern, uh, are, is the device that's being used to connect this a trusted device? Is this user who they say they are? And are they allowed to have access to this application that you're trying to connect to? And that's what Workspace One Intelligence was trying to do, is to bring the analytics to solve these problems in real time, to determine the level of risk that the posture and the user are bringing to the table so that if the risk is low, don't get in the way. Make this a seamless experience. If the risk is high, don't say no, but enable the user to be able to have stronger authentication or improve their posture so that they can get access but not introduce undue risk. One of the announcements at the show was the introduction of workspace security. Workspace security combines workspace one intelligence with a lot of our carbon black endpoint technologies, next gen AV, behavioral EDR, and the audit and remediation function so that the end user services teams, the desktop teams now have a full capacity to do the things they need to do to manage and secure those devices. Again, a lot of times, a lot of security is getting operationalized through that infrastructure team to harden and improve and prevent. The other announcement on the endpoint space is that uh, now you can, as of Monday, I believe, you can, anyone ordering a Dell machine, a Dell laptop, a Dell, uh, a Dell desktop, 
That can come from the factory with our next gen IV and our EDR. We're now the preferred endpoint security solution for Dell. These things can come pre-configured uh, from, from the factory. That's endpoint. Let's switch quickly to workload. Now, if an endpoint is a multi-purpose, multi-app user controlled, a workload is a single purpose, single part of a distributed app, admin controlled. So some of the same things are required. EDR is very effective. Almost everyone in this room will have AV running, even from a regulatory standpoint on workloads. But there is a unique opportunity on workloads to dramatically shrink the attack surface because it has a single purpose, because it is a single app, if you will, because these things should do a function and only that function. And therein lies a tremendous opportunity, right? If you think of the prevent, detect, respond as being the tip of the iceberg, underneath there is a huge opportunity to harden, to reduce the attack surface, to get rid of non-value added risk. Uh, I like this um, framework from Gartner. This was built by Neil McDonald, one of the senior fellows at Gartner. Uh, it's called the Cloud Workload Protection Framework. And basically what Neil did is he stack ranked all the kinds of things you could do to protect a workload in order of how much risk does it get rid of. The thing you could do to get rid of the most risk? Patch it. You know, harden it. Isolate it from a network perspective. OS integrity, memory integrity. Right? Things like encryption, things like those types of things that are hardening based on what this asset is supposed to do, that gets rid of huge chunks of our risk. What that doesn't do is good software being used for bad purposes, and that's where EDR starts to come into play. And things like host intrusion prevention and then next gen AV. That green part, that hardened part, can be radically improved if you understand the application it's delivering. Because what that provides is the ability to create a least privileged environment. This is not new. In fact, this is one of the oldest cybersecurity principles that was developed by Professor Salzer at MIT in the early 70s, right? A system should have, should be able to do what it needs to do to get its job done and nothing more. The problem with the principle is you need to understand your application and how it uses the infrastructure and most of us would not know that. But the opportunity here is that we have our infrastructure sitting right in between those two things. You already have our infrastructure sitting in between those two things. And that puts us in a position to actually understand what's running and what was provisioned there in the first place. We have the opportunity to do that without agents and from a isolated position, from a separate trust domain that you can't turn off if you have root onto the machine. And it's fully automatable. If we ever need to do anything, snapshot the machine, quarantine the machine, kill a process, it's entirely doable. So if an if a application is a comp composed of multiple workloads, what we were doing with AppDefense is the hardening of that workload. The first part of that is understanding what it is the full visibility of what it is and what it does and what it has on it. The second is to validate that workload. Is it good of what it is? It's continuous validation. And one of the big things we added was vulnerability management. This is not a periodic scan. This is the hypervisor monitoring vulnerabilities on your app, your OS, the virtual infrastructure, prioritized not just by CVSS scores, but whether or not these are exploitable. And workload protection. Not just app control, but things like change control. Tell me if one of these workloads has been changed and it isn't a patch, it isn't an update, and it isn't been something that's been validated on workloads elsewhere in the world. And that's what we've done with this automated hardening use case with the app defense technology. And we've done that by having something that inherently sees your workloads and we can bring in vendor context, that hash, we know that it's part of, legitimately part of Windows 2012 R2. Provisioning context, we integrate with the CICD pipeline. You're using Ansible Puppet to provision. We plug right in, we see exactly what you provisioned and intended that workload to be. And machine learning. We've been doing machine learning on goodware, not malware. 
If you see thousands of domain controllers, you start to build libraries of legitimate behaviors of domain controllers. Whatever weird combination of agents, operating systems, and software you have in a workload, we've probably seen thousands of them. And so we can start to build models of what's good. So we can sort of get rid of a lot of alerts about, we know this is validated. <clears throat> and then we've built a library of automated responses that you could use from everything from alert and snapshot to kill a process, all that use the virtual infrastructure. You're not adding anything. You're using what you've got. We've built this not only as a product you can add on, but we've built it into models of vSphere. So vSphere Platinum is a package that has this already sort of wrapped in with an interface, also part of the interface, right into vCenter. And we've built it into every package vSphere composes. So you can get VCS Platinum, VCF, VMware Cloud Foundation Platinum. It's a secure fabric, a whole secure data center. So Carbon Black Workload takes the next gen AV and EDR and audit and remediation, starts to add things like workload visibility, change control, and vulnerability management. So now we have these things coming together to, to get, be able to do that full pyramid from Gartner, from the Harden to the EDR to the next gen AV. So let's bring some of this to life. We have set up a couple of applications in a data center in California, as I mentioned. And it is time to bring up my evil attacker, our red team. And our red team today is uh, Evan Hernandez. Evan, welcome. <laughs> evil Evan. Thank you, Tom. Uh, could we uh, bring up uh, Evan's system? So, uh, so we have an application. It's the same application we did last year, Chords Chords. Uh, Chords, uh, uh, this is a, a, a Chris Chords' own business. And uh, Chords Chords, we have, a, uh, we have obviously an e-commerce system, and that's what we attacked last year. Uh, this year, we've also set up a supplier database. We're going to hack into Chords Chords, the e-commerce app, e application, move laterally and get in, steal the supplier database. So, Evan, where, where do we start with uh, something like this? Well, we start with reconnaissance, Tom, gather some information on what's running on the, on the front-facing website, so that way we can get, take that information and leverage it in an attack. Okay. So what Evan's going to be using is all off-the-shelf free stuff. It's a Kali Linux box. It's uh, tools that are used by red teams, are used by hackers, are used by lots of folks. And this, one of the tools I think you have is Nmap, right, you're using now just to sort of scan that front-end web service so you know what software Chords Chords is running, right? Correct. You can see Nmap showing that it's running on 443 using Apache Tomcat 9017. Okay. So next. So next, I'll use a search ploy to look for a known vulnerability with that version of Apache Tomcat. Okay. So this is the whole weaponization of cyberspace. There are tools. Search ploy is giving us. Here is a full list of uh, exploits that we can leverage. So uh, what Evan's going to look at is uh, finding an exploit that matches the exact version of the software that we have running on that. Yep, so I already have the exploit. We'll use the CGI service exploit to then try to gain a remote shell onto um, the e-commerce site. So a remote shell is going to essentially give us presence on that machine operating from our Kali Linux box as if we were actually sitting in the data center. And it's actually unsuccessful, Tom. Okay. So what uh, we set up security on this machine. So we have some endpoint security running on this machine. That's what is preventing him from doing that. So what do you do then? Yep, so I'm going to leverage the same exploit to query the system using tools on the machine to make sure that any security tools that are on there I can disable. Okay, and how hard is that? Uh, it's extremely easy because the hypervisor is not monitoring the, these agents. This is one of the big challenges. Endpoint security is great because it has the most context. The challenge is you're operating in the same trust domain as the attack surface. So once you have root on a machine, it's hard to protect root from root. So that's where some of these things end up getting turned off. Correct. So once you turned it off and you get remote shell, do you have your remote shell on? Not yet. Just want to have this come up. There we go. Okay. So once he has remote shell, now he can, uh, I, I suppose you can turn it back on now, right? Yep. So what the next thing I'm going to do is re-enable um, the security tool so that way we can fly under the radar and do what we have to do to that's, that's key. We want to fly under the radar, right? We don't want to create performance issues on your machines. We want to wipe our tracks. We want to be able to cover, put the security back on when we, when we don't need to have it off. Yep. 
All right, what's next? Next step is to redo reconnaissance, but internally and laterally, so that way we can get an understanding of the active directory structure and then leverage that in an additional attack. So today's attack, we actually took advantage of uh, domain controllers, of active directory. This is a wonderful thing from an attacker perspective because it gives you a map of all the assets and where they are. It also gives you a pathway. You can't firewall a domain controller. It has to be able to talk to everything. They're incredibly hard to secure for that same reason. So you're getting onto the domain controller. What do you see there? I got access to the domain controller. We can see we have three database tiers over here that we are going to query to, to see if there's anything in there that's interesting. All right, so now he actually can see where those databases are. Now, but the, you have the path there, but you don't have the credential there. Right, I need credentials. So what I'll do is I'll search the system that I'm on to see if there's any uh, common credentials that I can leverage and gain access to those databases. All right, there's a lot of ways that you steal credentials. Last year, if any of you were here, we used uh, a tool called Mimi Cats to do what's called a pass the hash technique. We took a hashed credential on one machine and we passed the hash over to the other machine. Uh, we wanted to mix it up this year. We actually used an incredibly simple technique. One of the challenges is that often the same credentials are used for multiple databases, so we took the credential from, I think, the e-commerce database, and we're using the same credential? Yep, we, we got the e-commerce database credentials, so now we'll query the other databases to make sure that, to see if they have the same password. All right, that will get him in. But once he's in, he needs to understand the structure of the database in order to construct queries to pull the data. Yep, so we got the password, I queried the database, and we can see that this supplier system has a, a decent amount of data that I want to leverage and send over to my C2 server. All right, so now you're going to, I guess, construct the queries to get exfiltrate? Yep. We'll dump the data, exfiltrate it out to my system, and then uh, sell it on the black market. You are a truly evil man. So this is sort of the concept, right? We now have been able to move the data, and probably the next thing that Evan's going to be doing is going to be start to cover his tracks on this. Uh, which will be things like wipe logs, make sure that all control yeah. mechanisms are sort of turned on. Everything's being wiped as we speak, Tom. All right. Can we bring up the PowerPoint for a second? All right. So, again, uh, just to summarize, and we put this, we frame this in terms of the MITRE attack framework. The first thing we really did, we used Nmap in order to get recon what software was running on that machine. We used that in order to go to search exploit to find some exploits for that particular software. We used that to move to get our position onto the app server, and we moved from that in order to the Active Directory server. That gave us the lay of the land. It showed us where the assets were that we wanted to go afterwards. We grabbed credential from the databases that we were on. We used those same credentials to access this database. We saw the structure of the database. We constructed a query against that. We then exfiltrated that data set, and we sort of wiping the tracks. This is the general idea of this attack, OK? Um, all right, and then he starts doing the, uh, the cleanup. That's our red team. Let's go to our blue team and see what do you do to defend against this kind of thing? Can we, uh, well, I, are we ready to flip onto your yep, screen? Yep, we're good. Okay, Nolan, hey. thank you. This is Nolan Karpinski. Nolan is going to be our vSphere admin Indeed. for today. Uh, now, uh, Nolan, we, we talked a little bit about the operationalization of security increasingly going to the infrastructure team. Yeah. That means vSphere admins are playing bigger roles in security. Exactly. Can you talk to that. Yeah, you said it was a team sport, and what that means to me is that I'm being asked to do things as a vAdmin that maybe I didn't before, but I always wear a security hat. And it aligns nicely because VMware is actually providing a bunch of these controls to help me do security-related jobs um, that are directly in vCenter and part of my day-to-day -day workflow. So a lot of the first step we talked about, which is visibility, yep. just trying to understand the environment, which yep. is probably useful to you, not just for security, but even for management. What kind of visibility do we have here? Yeah, so you see here I have uh, the topology diagram, which describes sort of how the di different parts of my application are interacting. Um, so I see the app tier here is talking to the database tier, and it looks like it's doing it over phpcgi.exe. And if I click on the actual <coughs> process, app defense is validating that this is actually good behavior in my environment. So it's not just baselining, it's exactly. understanding is it a good thing. Exactly, and that's, we're getting this from uh, Carbon Black. So this is how, at least part of how the Carbon Black integration is already popping up. Got it, all right, so now we have sort of the visibility as we start to move into sort of protecting and hardening. I guess one of those is, uh, is actually protecting the OS integrity. Exactly, so you talked about um, system integrity assurance, yeah. and this is really the hypervisor 
actually protecting that underlying operating system and making sure that, as Evan showed, you can't just turn off AV, right? It's also protecting underlying parts of the kernel, but this is the hypervisor protecting your operating system. All right. And then what about hardening starting to move up the stack and looking at these things like the reputation of the software, the yep. behavior of the software? Is it behaving differently than all its uh, brethren that are, have the same pieces on it, the vulnerability pieces. Yeah, exactly. So AppDefense also, again, all of this is directly in vCenter, and we're providing some, some validation as well. Yeah. So I can see that I have a number of processes running here, and one of them is high risk, and that is uh, MimiCats, which is a little odd. Um, so if I go to that application um, within vCenter, I can see that I have the app defense tab available here, guest monitoring, guest integrity, and then again, vulnerabilities. And you talked about how the majority of attacks actually start with a vulnerability, and app defense is bringing that capability to the table as well. Um, so I can actually find the Tomcat vulnerability that, that Evan is using here. Um, it's on page three. But here it is, that Apache Tomcat vulnerability, 9.0.17, that Evan just used to exploit this particular app tier. AppDefense is telling me that this is a known vulnerability and it has a really high risk score. All right, so instead of what used to happen, which is the security team is doing periodic scans and then you got 10,000 things to fix at the end of the quarter, the hypervisor is now monitoring for vulnerabilities in real all the time yep. and prioritizing them for you. Exactly. Uh, what's next, you just patch that? Uh, no, we don't just patch this right away. This is a, a really bad vulnerability. It actually has an active internet breach. But sometimes you just can't patch for business continuity reasons, all sorts of things. And so that's why we have the app defense control piece of this, and we have our security team that can actually shield these vulnerabilities even while we can't patch them. All right, so terrific. That gives us a pretty good picture of where the vSphere admins are using this technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's yeah. move it over. I appreciate it and bring up Vijay Gante. Vijay is going to be our InfoSec person for today. Hello, Tom. Uh, Vijay, uh, Nolan actually designed a lot of the vulnerability management pieces. Vijay actually uh, runs a number of things, including a lot of the machine learning technology in here. But you will be our InfoSec person for today. Yes. So uh, you actually, had, we had AppDefense running a while, but we actually just put it in monitor in the tech mode. Yes. What did AppDefense see while Evan was doing what he's doing? Yes, so Evan wasn't as stealthy as he thought he would be. Let's see what he was up to. Uh, I'm going to click on the alerts that come in, and the first thing I see is that a command shell was triggered, and when I get to the alert, I see the parent process for this command shell was Tomcat. Okay. That was the process that had a vulnerability. Let's look at that vulnerability here. I can see a critical vulnerability on this process. So now I know there's a vulnerable process which is invoking a command shell, and I see that it actually is setting up a PowerShell. So let me go and see what that was trying to do. Okay. I go here and look at the PowerShell. And here I see that it's actually turned off AV, which is what he was trying to do. So I can see that. That's not good. And on top of that, it's setting up a reverse TCP shell. Now I'm very, very worried. And Let's all of these are being seen not by understanding the techniques of attack, but by understanding what does the system normally do? These exactly. stand out as being different. Exactly. They were either the command line parameters were different. These were not things that the application was meant to do. Right. Okay. So I'm curious on what exactly is this reverse TCP shell being used for. So I open up this and say, whoa, I can see what he's up to. He's using port 53, which is DNS, yep. uh, often used for by attackers to, for command and control traffic. Also see that he's talking on port 389, which is my AD server. See so all that reconnaissance he was doing? So someone's going on your AD server? Absolutely, right? And I see port 21, which is FTP. So it's probably moving payload back and forth. At this point, I'm worried. All right. And this shell, I, I, I'll have to kill it, which I will right here. So you're, through this console, you're yeah. able to instruct the virtual infrastructure, in yeah. this case, vSphere, yeah. to actually go ahead and kill his process. Yeah, let's just do that. and. This should throw Evan out of the system. Now, you just did this manually, but you can set these in an automated fashion, right? This could have been something like someone's messing around with Active Directory, I'm automatically going to kill that process kind of thing that's you're doing something in that direction. Is that right? Absolutely. This policy could have been automated, and in that case, the kill would have happened much before. Okay. All right. Let's see. Evan? Hey, Evan, how are you doing? I'm just kicked out. I can't do anything. Yeah. Good, Evan. <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now, 
we can set up, what we were talking about earlier, we can set up process to enforce this on a real and an automated basis, right? Whether yep. that's as a vulnerability shielding thing or whether it's to harden certain devices, whether domain controllers, et cetera. Yep. Uh, how, how would that work? Yeah, actually, we could have operated, as I was saying, in block and prevent mode, right? And what I did while we were talking is actually change those rules. Earlier, this was set to block, uh, actually to alert, and now I've changed those rules simply by doing a few clicks here, and we've changed it to block and alert. Can we, can we see? Yeah, very quickly, we can have a look at, oops, sorry. Fat fingers, added service. And here's where you can That's do block and alert as opposed to just alert. It's a drop-down menu of different actions Absolutely. that you can do. All right, so now we've set up the system that it only allows what is legitimately, so, uh, why don't we re-execute the attack? Sure. Uh, can we bring up uh, Evan's screen? Thank you. No reverse shell. All right. And it's not because this has detection techniques for reverse shell. It's because this is not what that uh, system was designed to do, intended to do. That's not the normal function of that application. Let's, uh, if we can let him on, uh, if you can set up so that you can actually get on and give you a... I've already had the credit. Oh, you had, okay. <laughs> Uh, the RDP? Yeah, yeah, I give it to all the attackers often. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll run the AD recon again. Just Alex to Tasha, if you're in the uh, audience, <laughs> is not the guy you want on your security team. And I can't connect to the remote server, Tom. Yeah, I can't, can't connect on it because it's not because we're understanding the attack technique. It wasn't what the system was intended for. That's not what it does. All right. Nothing? Nothing. You're in an impossible position. All right. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you very much, Evan. Really appreciate the, the help on this. And, and Vijay, thank you so much. Uh, again, the concepts here are very simple. We're leveraging the fact that we understand inherently the applications and the workloads that are sitting up there. And that puts us in a very unique position in order to really harden this environment and get the visibility and context to detect and respond. You layer on top of that next-gen AV and EDR and query and audit and remediation. You have really a full stack without adding an agent, without adding uh, other consoles, a single console on this. Let me bring it to the last topic here, which is the cloud, right? In the cloud piece, some of the same concepts of workload security and network security still apply. What is different is you also have the infrastructure of the public cloud itself, right? And turns out this is a really big deal because if you look at the attacks that have gone against public cloud, EC2, Azure over the last several years, the preponderance of them are actually leveraging configuration issues on that public cloud, misconfiguring S3 buckets, misconfiguring privileged user access. So we have a solution called Secure State. It's very, very innovative, and what it does is it leverages, doesn't introduce a new agent, it leverages the APIs and the hooks into the public cloud itself, and it brings an analytic engine to be able to analyze in real time the configuration of all these elements. We can see problems of misconfiguration or configuring things far too open. It can see changes in configuration and analyze those pieces so that we're not just protecting the workloads and some of the network traffic on top of it, we're actually protecting the fabric and the infrastructure underneath that. And we wanted to bring that a little bit alive to you, for you today. And to do so, we're bringing on Hadar Freeling. Hadar, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for, sure. uh, for joining me. Thank you very much. Um, could, uh, oh, so we have so the DARS. right here. So, you know, Cords Cords is expanding, and you now have a, uh, a new acquisition, which has a all-cloud infrastructure. And, you know, when you do Cord acquisitions, you got to be careful. You don't know what you're bringing, introducing into the environment. So Cords is a rapidly expanding market. Who, all who kinds of parts. Yeah. So we've spun up Secure State, and it's taking a look at your environment. One of the things we're going to first take a look at is how are you doing in compliance? Because let's be honest, we all have compliance that we have to deal with. And so the product out of the box is going to show you how you're doing against some of these regulatory requirements, uh, as well as some of the best practices. So, so far, you look okay. You might need some work there. But now let's kind of look at some of the uh, violations. I'm going to click in here, and I'm going to grab a rule. And, and now we have a a large set of rule sets that we're looking for. Everything from S3 misconfiguration, to your point, uh, to enablement of logging, and things like that. Things that you should really take advantage of and uh, fix 
as much as, or as early as possible. Not so everything. There's a, there's a repository of intelligence about what are the kinds of things to watch out for, right, as you, as you go through and from a configuration perspective. Right? Correct. And so one of the ones we're going to pick on right now is this interesting one. It says, you know, an S, SSH key here is uh, being shared. And so I'm going to kind of get a little more details about it, but let's just kind of look at the actual rule and what it presents itself because I think it's visually more interesting to see. So I'm just going to click here. So this is an interesting scenario. It's very cloud-like in its problem, right? What, what I have here is I have an, a role of an admin assigned to an instance, right? In, in AWS, you have an IAM role profile, and you can assign a permission to an object, not just a user. So now I have these machines that actually have an admin rights. They share a key pair, which is basically your username and password, with other machines. And that's kind of odd, right? You don't want to share admin machines with non-admin machines, yep. it's usually not a good thing. And there's an internet gateway attached. So what's the risk? The risk is that somebody can get from the internet gateway into your instances, move laterally using that key pair, and they own your account. Not a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So now you have kind of this full visibility. You have a set of analytics that right out of the box tries to find and helps point out areas that you want to investigate. What about being able to kind of dive in and investigate more? Oh, that's true. Well, you know, one of the things we provide you, not only are we showing you who did this last change, as yeah. you can see, John, the developer, you might have a talk with him about that, but I can go into our Explorer tool and really search my environment to look for similar things that I'm already maybe concerned about, you know, because that instance, for example, maybe there's more of them. Yeah. That would not be a good thing. So I'm going to go into Explore here. I'm going to choose the account that I want to look at. And I'm going to say, you know what? Find me all the IAM profiles that I have available to myself. And let's see what we have. You have two. Not too bad. But again, let's see where they're being uh, utilized. So I'm going to attach them and say, OK, how many of these instances or these profiles are attached to instances? Some are, some aren't. Let's see what we got. OK, so you have five machines attached to an IAM profile. Now, this could be legit, this could be not, but being able to search for these things is really difficult within the native tools, and what Secure State does is it provides you a way of easily querying the, your cloud environment and finding this relatively sometimes obscure data. So it seems to me some of it is making it simpler to consume and to analyze, but then part of it is also how you enable a single source of truth to be shared across the DevOps team, the, in the infrastructure team, the security team, really into making it a sort of a more collaborative effort, right? Oh, that's, that's happening a lot in the cloud. It is. It's that shift left mentality, right? All of the data that we're presenting to you is also available via the API. So if you want to integrate this into your CI CD pipeline, try to prevent some of this, you know, your ounce of prevention. If I could prevent these misconfigurations from even being deployed, then I'm going to reduce a lot of the risk that I face. Fantastic. All right. Well, terrific. Kadar, thank you so much. Right, thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, if we flip back onto the slides, if we could. Um, Again, this notion, we already, you already, are leveraging a, a fabric that, that we have designed, and we are increasingly trying to make that the digital foundation for any cloud that you might need to use and any device that you need to have and, to, and any application. That can be leveraged. It is actually the perfect place start to leveraging security. If we want security to move and become more built in and more architected in, it's the perfect place to do this. So our vision is to leverage those things that you already have, to leverage that fabric, to leverage these points on the workload, on the network switch in the network, in the public cloud, on the user device, on the user access point, and to bring to bear the kinds of analytics to understand these systems, to understand these applications. The power of that helps not only shrink the attack surface and harden this, but also provides a much better way to prevent, detect, and respond to attacks. That is where all of that sort of industry is going. And so that's where we have been applying Workspace ONE to how we better manage the posture of devices and the users are connecting to things like vSphere Platinum and VCF Platinum to automate the hardening so people like Nolan can start to operationalize more of that, to secure state, to the configuration of the cloud, and of course NSX to see not only how we compartmentalize, but how we bring firewalling and IDS and IPS onto it using the fabric. And of course, Carbon Black now brings an incredibly rich set of security analytics 
not only to the endpoint and to the workload, but starting to embed that into these other solutions. This is what we mean by intrinsic security. This is, I think, the unique opportunity that we possess to really transform security and move it from a bolted on to a more built in model, to move it from these silos to a much more unified approach to security, to move it from something that is solely threat focused to something that also understands the applications we're trying to protect. That firefighter that we spoke of at the beginning about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Anyone know who that was? It was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, folks may not know that uh, Benjamin Franklin was a firefighter. He was also uh, an inventor. He was also an author uh, on the Constitution. He was uh, certainly an unconventional source for some of this. But you know what? Sometimes unconventional thinking comes from unconventional sources. You may not have thought of Benjamin Franklin as a firefighter, but that was in some ways thinking outside the box. You may not have thought of VMware as being a, a security vendor, but today we're probably uh, about a billion and a half dollars of revenue on security, and we are taking a very fresh approach to this. Sometimes unconventional thinking has to come from unconventional sources for this. There are a lot of next steps to find out, to learn more, and to start engaging in your journey in transforming security here at VMworld. There's a variety of sessions that are happening uh, later this week. There's obviously some sessions that have happened, uh, but these are some of the sessions. There are hands-on labs for many of the technologies that we described that you can engage on here after VMware. Uh, VMworld, we are posting many of these sessions up online, and there are some uh, great uh, resources here. So anyone want to grab a quick snapshot? These slides will be up on the, deck, uh, on the website eventually, but if you want to grab a quick snapshot, these are things that I think you can engage on to start moving forward. And we have um, a, a, a special thing called VMware Odyssey uh, on the, by Hands-On Labs, and this is a, a really something worthwhile, and there's prizes involved in this, but this is a great way to learn more and to really engage uh, on this. Um, and uh, I, I think someone afterwards is going to uh, talk through this, but I, I, hope this was, uh, I hope this was helpful. I hope this, uh, you enjoyed the session. It was a, an honor and a privilege to, to come and speak to you today. Enjoy the rest of the Thank you so much. <laughs>